So during the break, did you talk about neuroscience at all or did you just take a real break? Such a person comes to want a semi cushambe, petting on a tiny person snatching besa. Oh, on the three cushay, yes. We discussed about neuroscience. Yes, tell me what you discussed about neuroscience. Can you go to the Chimichi Sondas? How brain works when caring about it. Was that I heard how the brain works with what? Uh, Dicolche and Zokarsa. Take the Soso to Santa Nubotindigi and Nazita and Cadi Laval chat in each and another new drug Zuda. Eo Manzopena Nasa Nyonga diga Dumba Coila so but in the Mig Tomachi, Soso Chora and Tomachi, Jora. The Chora Lava Chan, a cup de dealer and Nicola Leven or Lola. The take a mock dealer so synchronized under the Leven love the Tino de Yung Zuda. ね、だからなぜ、なぜ、なぜ、なぜ、なぜ、なぜ、なぜ、なぜ、なぜ、なぜ、なぜ、なぜ、なぜ、なぜ、なぜ、なぜ、なぜ、なぜ、なぜ、
way of looking at things. But what we're seeing is the strangers help a little bit. There is a little pain reduction with strangers, but a big pain reduction with a loved one. But if you don't have the loved one speak, and if you can't see the loved one, then they're basically a stranger because there's no intimate connection if you don't know, if you can't see or hear them. Uh, so your proposal that you could have someone, anyone holding the hand and playing the sound of the loved one is a really good idea. Because that would make it so that the hand that's holding yours feels like the loved one, if you can hear the loved one speaking. And then to push that all the way, we would have to have another control condition in which no one is touching, but you can still hear. What do you think would happen? Do you think the touch um, or just the sound of the voice might have some impact on pain reduction? What is your guess? Yes. Yes. Uh, I have a question actually. Uh, can yes. I ask? So uh, when the stranger holds the hands of the patient, uh, it has a, some sort of little bit impact in, in terms of reducing the uh, pain. Yes. So does the level of you know, care or the sincerity or the compassion of the uh, stranger uh, makes any differences in terms of uh, reducing pain? I mean, you know, when you sincerely care, then when the, someone touch you and you can feel it, but not just, you know, being the stranger, but also their sincere care and compassion. Do you, Dawa, can you translate for That is such a beautiful question that I'm actually trying not to cry. Uh-huh. I um, I don't know that this has been tested, 
but I think it would be a really good thing to test. And I suspect that sincere compassion and concern from a stranger would still help with the pain. So if you remember when we talk about the scientific method, we usually start with an observation about the natural world. And if we think about our own experiences, you know, if you have been walking down the road and you see someone suffering and you reach out and you touch their hand, it probably does help them. You know that experience. You have been someone who's been hurt and someone touches you on the shoulder. Even if you don't know them, you have that experience of feeling a little less suffering. And my personal interest in neuroscience is about understanding the mechanisms behind these things that we see happening in our world. And what I think is really interesting is that throughout the history of humanity, we have made these observations about how compassion and empathy work, but we are just now in the last few years starting to try to understand the mechanism behind how it works. So my hope is that neuroscience will continue to unravel these mysteries and start to understand the mechanism behind a lot of the phenomenon that we see. So I want to show you something before we move on. Uh -huh, that, uh, uh, I think the, <laughs> I think there's one question. Do okay. Like it? Yes, okay. Um, okay. I I it's more like a different observation. Yes. Um, I had uh, regarding the a reduction of a pain uh, by touching someone uh, loved one's touch. Yes. So I think here the loved one has uh, to. I mean, someone if you depend on. Uh, then it might have some impact on reducing pain. But in case if the person who is touching your hand is someone uh, who you have to look after, uh, for, for example, your, your ch child, sometimes I, I have noticed that some patients, they prefer not to bring their child when they are going through some sort of a suffering because their expression of pain aggravated the pain in the person who is suffering. So in such a case, I think uh, you have to uh, clarify which sort of a loved one should be nearby to reduce the pain. Yes, very good. Will you translate that one? 
ถ้าเกิดเกษตรกรรมส่วนใหญ่ตัวที่การสนับสนุนการสู้กับตัวเอตาเกาหลีวิจิกลาพัชชัมไปนะสิเตาเกาหลีวิจิไปนะการสู้
Very often what happens if the caregiver is concerned about the other loved one, so in this case, let's say a child, if the caregiver is concerned about the child, they won't be able to focus on their own experience, and so that may not be helpful. So most of these studies have been done with romantic partners. But we have not done many with parental relationships or other brotherly or sisterly relationships. So here in this study in particular from 2018, the hand holding and the brain coupling um, saw a lot of activity in the areas that pain um, respond to and generally the right hemisphere of the person who is observing. So this is actually very exciting to me as we're talking about it. I'm starting to plan out research questions that you could even test back at the monasteries and nunneries. So I know many of you are familiar with EEG setup and I know that we're trying to get some equipment that will allow us to collect brain signals very easily. And if we're able to do that, it would be very interesting to see if the different relationships and the, the you know, maybe student and mentor, if those things have an impact on the results. <laughs> So something else um, that I wanted to introduce, because as you know, I am very interested in sleep. Have you ever had an experience of feeling more pain when you're sleep deprived? Can you tell the difference? The same kind of pain, but if you haven't gotten a good night's rest, it feels worse. Yes. So 
So uh, when I, yes. Uh, I, I just want to ask one question regarding the last paper you showed. Yes. Uh, um, so the, the couple or the partners who are tested, uh, they were, the, the suffering, the pain that they are uh, having is just an induced pain, like artificial pain. Yes. Or it's, okay. So um, how can you say that, uh, because there's a no risk factor, right? So they know that, that there's not, not a huge uh, risk involved in this uh, test. So how can you say that uh, the, by touching, uh, they have this uh, reduce in pain or what, what, what is the control? The control, yes. So, so for many of these, they, um, it's, uh, oh, do you need to translate the question? Uh so this um, is a very good insight. As you are trying to set up these experiments, remember they are artificial versions that we're trying to control many different factors. So because pain is subjective, we try to keep the insult, whatever the stimulus is, the same. So in this example, it is a hot stimulus and it's the same temperature for everyone. Uh so many of these research studies that induce pain use either temperature or a vibration um, that doesn't feel comfortable. It's a, it's a discomfort, it's an uncomfortable vibration that you can feel and they call it pain. And they ask the respondent or they ask the pain receiver to rate it on a scale. So the comparison that you're making is between the rating that you give the pain, the same stimulus, whether you're having your hand held by a friend or a loved one or a stranger or no hand holding at all. So they stimulate the mechanoreceptors or the thermoreceptors in the same way and just ask for a ranking. So 
Ninga Sugum Guchug in the Lambata Yana, to Sig in the Lambat in Tatugalaya, and the Cuchinti Tedeta, that the Telaya Kutsugata, that's Hitching Gubich Guris. So remember too that much of the pain or this tactile stimulation is interpreted in the spinal cord. But the brain involvement is the connection with the emotional or the mental part where you experience it as unpleasant. And that's the part that we're trying to understand more about. So what they're looking at is the comparison of how you respond about the same stimulus depending on the different circumstances. So an interesting thing about this study in particular is that they used women as the partners, um, as uh, rather as the subjects, because the background information we have is that women benefit from social support more than men. Now, can you repeat that again? Uh, so here, just... So they used women as the subjects because uh -huh. previous research has shown that women respond better to social support. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's why they used women as the participants. Yes, because then they could measure the difference. They, like uh -huh. it would have a bigger effect. And then had the idea that the frontal um, regions of the brain would have different alpha rhythms depending on the experience of pain. Okay, let's see if we can show figure one what this looks like. Uh, is is figure one showing or my screen? Oh. No? Okay. Uh, we still uh, see that. Yes, this one. So this is what the setup looks like. And so they're able to use the EEGs and look at what the brain activity is of both participants. But the measurement that they're using is just the subjective response, the rating, the, mm -hmm. the score you give to the pain. Uh, I'm trying to, so here, to show the synchrony between the brains, you can see the different areas that are now synchronizing or responding together. And so their conditions are no touch with no pain or touch and no pain. And so they have they have to to vary all these different things. So 
how does it feel if you have no pain and you're getting touch? What areas of your brain are active? And then they compare that all across. So that's a very long answer to say, yes, the controls are there for touch and pain and the different types of people, but it's really just about how the pain receiver responds or rates the pain that they are experiencing. Any more questions about this? This is my favorite right now, but we are going to move on a little. Okay. I think no questions. There are many questions, but they are going to oh, hold. Yes, yes, one question. I know. Okay. One day. Uh, from my personal experience, like it seems like there is correlation between pain reduction and uh, mental destruction. So, for example, like uh, when you have toothache, yes. So during the day, it seems less painful, but when it comes to night, it is so painful. So, is there like any neuroscience mechanism behind this, or? It is just like bacterial activity during night. I like that question a lot. Uh, <laughs> At your tables, very quickly, I would like you to think about what are the variables in that scenario that was just described? What are the variables you could measure mm -hmm. in order to ask a good research question about that particular case? Just, just one or two minutes toothache in the day is not bad in the night is bad i want you to think about what could you measure to see if there is a real difference
Okay, just quick. That's all. What can you measure? So uh, in our group, like uh, Gizu Lodo Zambu has suggested that uh, the person who have to the should, you know, watch movies during the night and mm. see whether it is still painful or not. Okay. That's a good suggestion. But what I want to hear is what can we measure about the difference between day and night? What might the difference between day and night be? Okay. Any tables have other ideas about what, what can you measure as a difference between daytime and nighttime? Yeah, group number one. Uh, yes. Chen, Chen la da nasu shuk chhe tu ya da yin la nasu shuk chhun tu ya kim chen da ji zo gari insa si na yingu yin na so wambo nga ga da pei kuri la shibu ji tin sa ma dene information Mambo the sensor organs are involved with uh, getting uh, a whole lot of information from the environment. Uh, and uh, you don't feel the pain that much, but during night, all that sensor organs shut down and uh, you have a specific or like uh, assigned part of the brain that uh, just target or aims only on the pain. That's why we feel uh, during the night, you feel the pain more intense. Okay, so you are attention. Your attention is different in the day. You're paying more attention to other things, so you don't have time to pay attention to the to the toothache. Is that am I understanding that? Okay. Okay. So, yes. So if you're busy, you don't have time to think about the pain. So the pain may be happening or the, the, the noxious stimulus, the, the whatever is going on is still present, but you're just not noticing it because you are busy doing other things. So that would actually align with the other uh, observation um, or comment that maybe suggests that they watch movies or do something else because that will distract them and put their attention on something else and to see if that is what is the source of this experience. So if we think about the hand holding study, the difference is that you are busy and not paying attention, or if 
in, in if you compare that to the hand holding study, there is no difference in the stimulus. It's just how you respond to it. So the physical stimulus remains the same, but the emotional interpretation is different. Uh, are you seeing the whiteboard? Yes. Okay, good. Um, which, you know, it's in, in uh, English. What are other things that are different about the day and the night time? Hello. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, rhythm. Yes. Yeah, I wrote that. Was that what you were going to say? Yes, yes. Very good. So, in biology, I know you talked a little bit about circadian rhythms. Is that true? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, I did... Did your biology instructor share this website with you? No. no. Okay. So this website um, has a lot of really good information about circadian rhythms. And it talks about how our different genes, how the clock genes can set different um, levels of our body temperature or hormones or all sorts of body functions. So your brain is a little bit different in the night than it is in the day. So it's possible that the night time, your brain conditions make it better for the experience of pain. So certain hormones and neurotransmitters are higher in the daytime and some are lower uh, and, and lower in the nighttime and, and the other way around. So that's another possible difference between the day and the night time. And how about one more thing that's different between the day and the night? Temperature. Another one is uh, the climate or weather uh, or the temperature because sometimes during the daytime they feel more comfortable because of the heat from the sun and at night or like in a cooler situation you may have some, some sort of 
a body ache or like back pain or other sort of problems you know Yes. So this is good because if you're thinking about how to answer that question, and I know I'm taking a long time to answer this, but if you think about the toothache in the day versus the night, there's so many different factors that could be changing and influencing your perception of pain. So if you are thinking about setting up an experiment and you want to know if it's the circadian rhythm that has an effect, you would be able to measure the pain or the response to pain during the daytime and the nighttime. Another important difference between the day and the night time actually matters if you've been awake for the whole day. So if you wake up in the morning and you live the whole day, by the evening, your body is tired, your brain is tired, you've been working all day. So the difference you might be seeing in your pain reception or per pain perception may not be about the night and the day. It may be about how much sleep you have gotten and how much sleep you need. So every night when you go to bed, you have been sleep deprived for the time that you've been awake. So the conditions in your brain are very different from when you wake up. So Dawa and I are, are having a very different experience from you in the classroom because we just woke up we just started our day, but you're at the end of your day. Mm-hmm. So this class is less painful for me and Dawa than for you. Mm-hmm. So what I wanted to show you um, let's see if I can find it again. I just did a Google search. That's um, what I want to show you. Where is it? Ah, yes. So if you just type in sleep deprivation and pain perception, 8 million results will come up. So this is something you could also have your students look at. It's how pain sensitivity or how you respond to pain is influenced by how much sleep you have gotten. 
So one of the things that you can think about is how sleep deprivation increases how unpleasant pain feels. So if you're not getting good sleep, pain sensitivity is higher. So in this study, they had healthy participants who they had the experience of pain. So they used healthy participants. Now, the reason to use healthy participants is because if you have some pain causing um, problem or disorder, then you may not be getting good sleep anyway. And so the two things could be influencing each other. So what they will look at is if you do total sleep deprivation, that is to say you have no sleep for one full night, and then they look at how you respond to different painful stimulus. So what you can see is your sensitivity to different pain, your pain threshold will change if you have no sleep. So what that study that we just, just described very briefly, it teases apart the difference between being awake um, all day or the circadian rhythm and the nighttime versus the daytime. So much of the research in this area is still very new and we're still trying to understand how it works. And much of it is based on our observations about how things just work. So you make an observation, oh, my tooth hurts more in the night than it does in the daytime. And then we start to ask questions about what might be the factor that is influencing that difference in perception. Mm-hmm. 
So this is where it's really important for you to help your students to understand that they can go and search to see if someone else has had a similar idea and been able to get the funding to do the research to get an answer to the question. So if we go back to my very first day of what are um, learning about learning, one really important topic is that we do have a natural curiosity to understand how the world works. So we can ask our students to think through these inquiry-based questions and then we can check to see if some research has already happened. So we want you to be able to make these connections and if the research already exists, you can analyze this research and see how it fits in to what basic fundamental ideas you already have. What questions do you have about this? Very good. No questions? Oh, they're muted. Try this, try it, and try it on this. Yeah, look like no question. Okay, good. Uh, I'm trying to share my screen, but I'm not getting the right one. Okay. Oh, I'm not, I can't get my screen. Okay, so my intention originally was to go through the assessment questions by a, a few different tables. And I, I selected the first group as pain, and then my second one was going to be stress. But we got so interested in that hand holding study and the pain perception that it took up a lot of time. But I'm not upset about it because we were able to cover a lot of really important information. And it gives an opportunity to think about things from many different angles. So it shows the power of being able to go and find research 
and make a connection to the lesson that's being learned. So I'll show you what my plan was for today and um why it's different, but how I um but why I'm not upset. So we were going to review active learning again and think about how if you do something, if you're actively involved in it, then you are much more likely to remember it. You will learn it. So active versus passive learning um, of the different types of ways that you can provide instruction, lectures are the most passive. So so I know Mina must have gone over with you for pedagogy how lectures, didactic lectures, are very passive. But you can interrupt your lectures with questions. This is the think, pair, share, and other tools that you can use. If you're giving a lecture, you can still interrupt it and have the students engage. So I had planned for us to go through an example worksheet. So this paper, um, and don't worry about the details of it, but this paper forms the basis of so this paper that was published in 2012 forms the basis for a worksheet that you we that I use in my sleep class. But when we started talking about that hand holding research, the pain and hand holding, it served as a kind of worksheet. So this paper has um the details and the introduction directly from the paper is what I show to the students. Uh, 
You know, I don't know if my screen is sharing the same thing. I usually see the green box around it, but are you, what are you, are you seeing my slides? Yes, I see the Q1. Q1? No. Get out this slide. Okay. Uh, hmm? I said, no, I see the slide and the, the number, is the Q1 and a hyper and a hypo that one. Ah, uh, yes, but I was at a different, so that's weird. I was at a different part. Oh, this is strange. I am not looking at the same thing that you're looking at. I don't know how to fix that. Also, oh, uh, they're saying that they cannot see because the font size is small. I mean, yes. can you share that in the Google Classroom? Certainly, certainly. Um, but I'm trying to see why why I, I'm not seeing this. You're not seeing the same slides that I'm showing. But Probably, I yes, because uh, can you show that again? Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, we're on the same page now. This one? Yes, yes. yes I, see I can that. see the green box now. So I was showing you, this was what I was trying to show you before. This is the example of the worksheet. It's a primary source. And then this is the introduction directly from the worksheet, um, okay. from the, the paper. Okay. Okay. And uh, so the, the questions here are based on the introduction. And then we ask the students to work in their groups to come up with the answers for each of these. And then we can ask them to draw diagrams to show the relationship between different things. Mm -hmm. Well, what we ended up doing when we analyzed that paper that I found and pulled up about hand holding and pain, that we did the same thing. So sometimes you can follow the interest of the students in your group. And if something comes up, you can still find a way to use that topic to teach something that you had intended to teach anyway. So what I wanted to show you was don't be afraid of following the interest in the group, asking questions and directing it towards those things that you've outlined in your assessments. So what this worksheet would look like, for instance, is the peer-reviewed journal article and then all the information about it and then asking different questions along the way. So you can see that it has um, interrupted, um, it's broken the paper down, and then there are questions at each point. So 
So you can give students an opportunity to go through and to answer questions about something that you're prepared to deal with. Uh -huh. So for something like this, that's already, you prepare it ahead of time so that you can be confident about your answer. So right here, I'm showing you the answer key for that, um, for that worksheet. So for this answer sheet, this, this worksheet, I already know what the answers I expect to be. And so I can spend time with the students going through the mechanism behind some of these. So you can see here that if you have this prepared, right, you know what assessment it is, you know what the students should be able to answer, then you can use the opportunity to go back and forth between what you want them to take away, but also what they are interested in. So this worksheet in particular is one of my favorites. It's developed by Kate O'Toole, who has taught in Etsy. She usually teaches in the biology section. And uh, one of the researchers on this paper actually has taught in the Emory Tibet Science Initiative as well, Paul Garcia. So when I use this worksheet in my classes at Emory, it's really nice because I can make a connection between people who they might see around campus or somebody they've heard of. And this is some local, really important research that's happening and they can make a connection with it. So as we are thinking about how to provide instruction in our classes, in the monasteries and the nunneries, I want you to think about things that the students will engage with and things they'll recognize or even um, anything relevant to their lives. So this case is really interesting because I use it when I teach my sleep class, but I have a colleague who uses it when she teaches neurochemistry. Uh -huh. 
so our learning objectives when we use this case are very different. And this would count as a formative assessment because we're using it during class time and we're working on acquiring some new knowledge. But I don't expect the students to memorize everything on here. Here I expect them to learn the skills that are required to make a good deduction. so when I put a question like about this on their exam, I don't expect them to know every single detail of what happened here. But in order to do this assignment, they had to learn how GABA, a neurotransmitter, and its receptors work. So at the end of the learning session, my expectation is that they will be able to describe more about GABA than when they just started. And then this is a case about extra sleepy people, so people who have extra excessive daytime sleepiness. So at the end of the time that we have covered this lesson, they should be able to answer questions about GABA, about receptors, and about excessive daytime sleepiness. I really enjoy this case, and so I'm going to ask for it to be translated into Tibetan eventually. Um, it may not be now, but you will be able to use this resource in your classes at some point. So I want you to be able to think about what are things that are interesting to you and your students, and you don't have to just use the Emory Tibet Science Initiative curriculum. You can include other things and more current research I want you to be able to, to start to think about how you can use these other things in your classes. Uh -huh. 
ตาเตตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันตันต
Okay. Now so, which now?